Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. I really can't remember who requested this case um, because I think it was a couple of weeks ago I asked people for case recommendations and you guys gave me case recommendations and I put them all in a Google Doc um, and I, I remember seeing this one. So if it was you who recommended this case, please identify yourself in the comments because, I mean, I truly enjoyed putting these videos together. And I experienced a wide range of emotions in the process. You know, I'm, I'm not even being dramatic or like hyperbolic. I cried. I laughed. I gasped out loud. I groaned in disbelief. I, I felt awkward at times. I felt excited at times. This story is a lot of things, right? It's sad. It's very sad. There's parts of it that are very sad. There's parts of it that are just <laughs> ludicrous. There is a lot of interesting characters, a lot of mystery. But as we're going through all of that, I want you to try and keep one person in mind because this person tends to get lost in the story. And the person I'm talking about is Nicholas Barclay, a 13-year-old boy who went missing in the summer of 1994. Now, a lot is going to happen. A lot's going to happen that will distract you from Nicholas. It, it will pull your attention away here and there from Nicholas. And that's fine. It happened to me too. But at the end of the day, we need to come back to Nicholas. Now, I had briefly heard about this case years ago on someone else's YouTube channel. And I mean like years ago, before I was even doing videos on YouTube. I can't even remember whose channel it was that I heard about it on. But I remembered thinking at the time, because I, I actually remember exactly where I was. I was on the treadmill at the gym and I was watching like a 15 minute YouTube video about this case. And I remember thinking, there has to be more to this story. And when I saw someone request this case in the community page, it brought me right back to that moment, that moment that I said, there's more here to find. And now it was finally my chance to go down that rabbit hole and find out all that I could so that I can, you know, deliver it to you lovely people. And after I did the bulk of my research on this case, I ended up watching a documentary. They used to be on Netflix, but it wasn't on Netflix when I went back to watch it. So I was like, oh, crap, that sucks. I can't watch it because I wanted to watch it. And then I found it on Tubi. I know I've talked about Tubi before. I know I've told you guys to go watch the documentary Sins of the Father on Tubi about the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgway, because I was in that documentary. And I know it might seem like I'm like pushing Tubi. It's really a coincidence because I found this documentary on Tubi and they have a lot of documentaries, a lot of true crime documentaries, but I found this one on Tubi, which I was so pumped about because you can watch it for free. There's ads, but you can watch it for free. So I watched it on Tubi finally and... It was good. It's really, really valuable to see the people that we talk about in these videos, to to hear them talk, to kind of get an idea of their mannerisms, their body language, things like that, and try to decipher, like, what's true here? What, what makes sense and what's true here? So if you haven't watched that yet, you should, but don't watch it until we've already gone through these two videos because this deep dive is only going to be in two parts. But before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video native. You already know. <laughs> I talk about it all the time. Even on my social media, I just posted a story yesterday being ridiculous with uh, one of Native's body washes. But you guys know I ride hard for Native. I truly do love their products and I really do use them. I've been using their deodorant for years. Um, about a year and a half ago, I started using their body wash, maybe even longer, maybe like two years at this point. But now it's the only body wash I use. And there is so much to love and appreciate about Native. Native deodorants are made with familiar and simple ingredients that you know and love, such as coconut oil and shea butter. They're also aluminum free, paraben-free, cruelty-free, and vegan. And the texture of Native's deodorants is great too because you don't need a lot, just a few swipes, and they go on non-sticky, smooth, silky. They don't crumble all over the place and make a mess, and they dry super fast so you can get on with your day. And you can move on with your day with the knowledge that you're going to smell good all day long. Native deodorants provide 72-hour protection even after running around in this summer heat, even after exercising, even after filming in front of hot students studio lights for hours, you're going to smell good. But what you smell like exactly 
is up to you because Native offers a wide range of scents and they're always adding new and limited edition scents. Right now, Native has their summer seasonal scents out and they are serving up the perfect summer day with their limited edition cocktail inspired collection. Think Pina Colada, Lakeside Ginger Mule, and Poolside Citrus Spritz. People make fun of the way I say Pina Colada. I know it's Pina Colada, but I like to say Pina Colada because when I was a kid, you know that song, If You Like Pina Coladas? Well, when I was a kid, it sounded like Pina to me. So that's how I said it. And now that's how I say it. So don't make fun of me. But Citrus Spritz has become like my go-to hot weather body wash. It's clean. It's fruity smelling. It's a really unique scent that gives me feel good vibes as soon as I pop it open. Like, I can't explain what it is about it. It smells clean and fruity at the same time. It's just so unique, so good, so refreshing. The uh, pina colada scent, it's also really amazing. And I was surprised that I ended up liking it as much as I did because I don't like the smell of coconut. And every pina colada scented product I've ever tried smells so artificial, but not natives. Someone in the uh, comment section of a previous video said it best. They said the scent is very pineapple forward, but it has this nice nutty and natural undertone. That's exactly what it is. It smells really, really good. Native also has their matching deodorant in the same scent, citrus spritz, as well as pina colada, as well as all of their scents, basically. So I've actually been using the matching deodorant too. But the deodorant that I've been like obsessed with lately, for some reason, is like an OG sea salt and cedar. And I think it's because my husband, Adam, uses the sea salt and cedar body wash. It's his favorite. He won't use any other body wash. And so I think it smells like him. So I kind of have been like drawn to that lately but I really like the way it smells it's like clean once again spicy really good the rosé deodorant which is also a special edition scent is another deodorant I have been loving and you know I have to give a shout out to Native's body washes everyone in my house uses their own scent of body wash from Native Bella loves anything peach scented like I said Adam is loyal ride or die for sea salt and cedar my son Aiden won't take a bath without his eucalyptus and mint body wash he makes me like put it in under the running water and it makes like bubbles it smells so good and my oldest daughter Nev loves anything they have that has lavender in it these body wash they suds up so beautifully it gives you this like creamy lather that leaves your skin feeling hydrated and refreshed never dry and the smell just fills up the whole area it lingers all day long and I can smell it on my skin throughout the day as well which I love because I'm like who smells good it's me I think everyone should try Native out for themselves, and usually three deodorants are $39, but if you click on the link in my description box and use code STEPHANIEH22, you can get them for $26. That's over 33% off. With that same code, you can also get 20% off any body wash or toothpaste, and I use my own code to stack up on body wash at least once every few months. Click on the link, use code STEPHANIEH22, get yourself some amazing deodorant. I suggest the Citrus Spritz, all day citrus spritz pina colada sea salt and cedar and get yourself some body wash you won't regret it thank you so much to native for sponsoring today's video and let's dive right in nicholas patrick barclay was born on december 31st 1980 and he was raised in san antonio texas by beverly dollarhide a single mother who was reportedly struggling with an addiction to heroin throughout most of Nicholas's childhood. Now, Beverly had two other children, a daughter, Carrie, and a son, Jason, from a previous marriage. Uh, Beverly had divorced Carrie and Jason's father, and she never married Nicholas's father, and both Carrie and Jason were much older than their younger half-brother. Now, when you look at Nicholas, you look at a picture of him, not knowing anything about his history, or his complicated family dynamics. All you see is like a really truly adorable little boy. He looks like a sweet, innocent kid. You know, like any kid running out there, playing soccer in the field, playing street hockey, riding his bike. He has these sparkling, mischievous, bright blue eyes, this like cute floppy blonde hair, and a little gap between his front teeth that just adds to his cuteness. He looks like the cool kid, right? The kid that the boys would want to be friends with because he was always doing something fun. The kid that all the girls had crushes on because he would wink and, you know, flash them that little smile of his in the halls. And Nicholas, he did, he really looked innocent. And he was small for his age too. He was only four foot eight. He weighed about 80 pounds. 
And that just kind of made him appear to be younger, more harmless, more sweet. But Nicholas Barclay, even at his young age, he was going through a lot of stuff. By the age of 13, he had already been in trouble with the law multiple times. He had a juvenile record for breaking into a convenience store, for threatening his teachers and his mother, and for stealing a pair of tennis shoes. And this was a charge that he was scheduled to appear in juvenile court for on June 14th, 1994. And at that point, it would be decided like, what was going to happen with him? What, what would we do with him? Because his mother, Beverly, was at the end of her rope with her youngest child, according to her. Now, the police had been called to his house multiple times in response to arguments between Nicholas and his mother. And it was said that Nicholas could be verbally and sometimes physically abusive to his mother, Beverly. According to neighbors, the police would come at least three times a month. And Nicholas would often be out in the streets, running around, getting into trouble, not getting home until very late at night. His sister, Carrie, would later say, quote, he was not this perfect, nice, sweet, innocent kid. He was a very street smart city boy, end quote. It's been said that Nicholas most likely suffered from ADD, and he skipped more days of school than he attended. And at the age of 13, Nicholas already had three tattoos, and apparently these tattoos were basically given to him by his friends, like kids his own age, which is crazy. So he had the letter T tattooed on his left hand between his thumb and forefinger, the letter J tattooed on his left shoulder, and the letters L and N tattooed on the outside of his left ankle. So keep in mind that this is the situation that we're kind of dealing with here. This kid seems to be left to his own devices a good deal of the time, right? Otherwise, how would he be able to just be running the streets having like other 13-year-olds giving him, you know, basically jailhouse tattoos. How would that be possible if there was boundaries and rules and supervision happening at home? And what do these letters symbolize for 13-year-old Nicholas? The letter T, the letter J, the letters L and N together. What are they a representation of that they were important enough that he would have them tattooed on his body? Uh, his name doesn't start with any of them his family's name like he's got a brother Jason where you know J may stand for Jason but I doubt it right and were they names of his friends names of his girlfriends I don't know what the purpose of them was and I kind of look to see if they have any like meaning as far as gangs go I really didn't find anything. But Nicholas had become such a problem that his mother, Beverly, had asked her older son, Jason, to move in with them and help her keep the wild youngster under control. Beverly had her own life to live. Aside from her drug problem, she was working the graveyard shift at the local Dunkin' Donuts seven nights a week, and she had a routine. She would go into work at 10 p.m., leave at 5 a.m., make a quick stop at the Make My Day Lounge, where she would shoot some pool and have a few beers, and then she would go home to sleep until she woke up and did it all again the next day. Now, according to her daughter, Carrie, Beverly wasn't a bad mother, despite her vices. Carrie said that Beverly was known to drop off leftover donuts to the local homeless shelter after her shift. And Carrie said, quote, she was maybe the most functioning drug addict. We had nice things, a nice place, and we never went without food, end quote. But there are things that children need, especially young children, that go beyond food, shelter, you know, nice things. They need attention. They need guidance. They need to be educated. They need boundaries. Things like that that maybe Beverly Dollarhide was too overworked and too kind of distracted to provide. By the time Nicholas was coming of age and acting out, Beverly was older. She was tired. She was exhausted from fighting battles with her son and with her own demons. But her older son, Jason, wasn't really in the best shape himself to help his mother raise a wayward boy. Jason was 24. At the time that Beverly asked him to come and move in with her, he was living with a cousin in Utah. But as his sister Carrie put it, Jason had his own demons too. At the age of 13, Jason had accidentally set himself on fire, 
leading to his face and body being burned and scarred. And from what I could tell, this was an accident. He was like filling a lawnmower with gasoline and he lit a cigarette at the same time and whoosh, you know, that'll happen. Um, But once again, we've got Jason at 13, not only setting himself on fire, but he's smoking cigarettes. So it kind of seemed as if Nicholas was probably following in the path of his older brother. Jason had never finished high school, but people said he was still very bright, intelligent, and he was a very good artist. But he was like a little melancholy. You know, he was all scarred and he thought he'd never, you know, find somebody to love him or accept him for how he looked and who he was. He, you know, would play the guitar and he'd be very sad and sort of just be a little bit of a loner. However, similar to his younger brother, Nicholas, Jason was said to have a quick and violent temper, and like his mother, he had an addictive personality. He drank too much, and he used cocaine. And Jason would end up being the last person who ever talked to Nicholas Barclay before the 13-year-old vanished into thin air on June 10, 1994. Now, on that day, Nicholas had left his house wearing a white shirt, purple pants, and sneakers. He was carrying a pink backpack that held $5 his mother had given him before telling him to be home by dinner. Now, Nicholas headed to the basketball courts about a mile and a half away from his house, and there he hung out and he played with his friends for a while before one by one they left and went home. When everyone was gone, it's reported that Nicholas used the payphone next to the courts to call home and get a ride. But it was not his mother who answered his call. It was his older half-brother, Jason. Allegedly, Jason scolded Nicholas and told him that he should know better. He should know better than to call in the middle of the day or expect a ride at this time when their mother was sleeping before getting up to go into work. Jason said that he didn't want to start the car because he was worried that starting the car would wake Beverly up. So he told Nicholas to just walk home. But Nicholas never got home. For the first day or so, Beverly and Jason, they weren't terribly worried about Nicholas or where he was. They certainly didn't think that anything bad had happened to him. Nicholas had pulled stunts like this before. He would get in a fight with his mother or his brother, they'd say something he didn't like, and he would disappear for a day or two before showing back up. Beverly would say, quote, He thought he was an adult. We called him 13 going on 30. Very difficult to discipline him. If he made up his mind he was going to do something, pretty much there wasn't a lot you could do, end quote. But there is, because he's 13, and you're his parent. He's a child. You're an adult. There are things you can do. But as the days passed, Beverly realized that Nicholas hadn't taken any clothes with him. He hadn't taken any money with him, right? All he had was that $5 in cash. None of his friends knew where he was. No one had spotted him around town. He was just gone. Finally, on June 13th, Three days after Nicholas had vanished, Beverly called the police and reported her son missing. But the police were also not so sure that something terrible had befallen Nicholas. They were very familiar with him, with his dysfunctional family, with the antics that had been going on at the house, with the drug use. And they basically said, you know, this kid just took off again. He's a bad apple. He's bad news. He'll show back up. Now, Nicholas's disappearance was eventually listed as a missing person, and law enforcement went looking for him. But by that time, if there had been any leads to follow... They were long gone. In the aftermath of Nicholas's disappearance, his family fell apart even more. Beverly, who had been fighting to get off drugs for years, she relapsed, and she quickly became addicted to methadone as well. Jason also began using drugs more heavily. His behavior became even more violent and erratic than before. His family members felt that this was due to his guilt, right? His guilt over not giving Nicholas a ride home on the day he disappeared. On July 12, 1994, so about a month after Nicholas went missing, Beverly called the police. But when they arrived at her home, she claimed she was fine. But Jason told the officers that his mother had been drinking and screaming at him because her other son had run away. A few weeks later, Beverly called the police again. And the officer on the scene wrote in his report that Beverly and her son Jason had been exchanging words. Jason was asked to leave for the day, and the incident was described as family violence. 
on September 25, 1994, Jason called the police, claiming that he had seen his little brother Nicholas attempting to break into the family garage. This is about three months after Nicholas goes missing. And now Jason's calling the police and he's like, oh, I saw my brother who's been missing for three months, who there's been no sign of him at all in San Antonio. They've asked everybody. Nobody's seen him. But I've seen him. He's at my house trying to break in. Now, by the time the officers arrived, there was no sign of the missing boy. There was also no sign of an attempted break-in on the garage or on the house. Now, Jason would later be arrested for using violence against a police officer. This is not in relation to him calling and claiming that Nicholas was trying to break into the garage. It's a whole separate incident. Jason then went on a drug and alcohol binge, and his mother kicked him out of the house. At the end of 1996, Jason would check into a drug rehabilitation center. All right, so let's recap quickly before moving on to the next section. Nicholas Barclay is 13 years old. In my opinion, he looked like he was about 11. But either way, he's still quite young. He goes out to play basketball with his friends. His brother, Jason, tells him to walk home because he's not going to give him a ride, which is fine, right? Because Nicholas walked to the basketball court. It's about a mile and a half away from his house. Um, Longer than I would let my 13-year-old kid walk alone, but It's a different time. I'm also super paranoid. I wouldn't really let my kids walk alone anywhere. So not judging, just making a note that he had walked to the basketball court so he could walk back. But at some point between the basketball courts and home, Nicholas went missing. He never made it home. And his mother, she didn't report him missing until three days later. I'm just going to say it. I don't really like to judge, but... I don't care how grown your child thinks they are, unless they are actually grown, unless they are actually capable of taking care of themselves, you don't not worry when they're gone for days, right? You don't not worry when they're gone overnight, especially if you don't have any idea of where they are. So like if Nicholas was at a friend's house and Beverly was in constant contact with that friend's parents, so at least she was aware of what was going on, but she still wanted to give her son the opportunity to cool off. That's fine. But to not know where he was, to not hear from him, and then to still not report him missing for days? Like, come on, right? And there's a lot of other factors that complicate the situation and muddy the waters. Everyone wants to talk about how bad Nicholas was, what a handful he was. And that's fine. I'm sure he was. But he was also 13. And there was a reason he was acting like that, right? A reason that has a lot to do with how he was raised, what rules were or were not set for him, what he was allowed to get away with for so long to the point where he felt that he was basically raising himself. And then you have the two adults in the house, Beverly and Jason, who both have a history of using drugs and alcohol. And it seemed there were some arguments and confrontations between them in the months after Nicholas disappeared. And no one ever heard from Nicholas after that. He may have been a street smart kid that acted like an adult, but he didn't have any money or any place to stay. To me, there's no doubt that something had happened to him, something bad. And as the years passed, his mother and sister lost hope that he would ever be returned to them alive. And it's true that the majority of child abductions are done at the hands of family members or people they know, usually custody things. But the odds of a child being taken by a stranger and then returning home at some point in the future, they are slim to none. Parents of abducted children always go on the news and beg for their child's return, trying to appeal to whoever took their child. But I don't know many cases where the kidnapper was like, you're right, I feel terrible about this. Here's your child. And, I mean, there was no hope of really, like, tracking down the person who had done this, especially when the police didn't really do anything in the most crucial hours and days after Nicholas's disappearance. But then something miraculous happened in October of 1997, three years after Nicholas was last seen. On October 7th, 1997, Jonathan Durian, who was the director of a youth home in Leonara, Spain, he called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Alexandria, Virginia. Dorian said that there was a frightened young boy who had been brought to him after being found wandering the streets. The boy was frightened and he wasn't saying much, but he spoke English with an American accent. He was short and slim and he had a little gap between his two front teeth. 
Dorian wanted to know if there were any reported missing children who matched that description. Now, the woman that he was speaking to from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, she did a search on her computer, and she was like, hey, like, it sounds like you may be describing Nicholas Barclay, a 13-year-old boy who had gone missing three years ago in Texas. So she faxed Nicholas's missing person poster to John Dorian in Spain so that he could compare the picture of Nicholas to the lost and scared child he had with him. And within minutes of that fax going through, John Dorian had called back and said, listen, this is Nicholas Barclay that I have with me. Nicholas Barclay is standing right next to me. Now that same day, San Antonio police received a call from a policeman in Leonaris telling them that Nicholas Barclay had been located 5,000 miles away from his hometown of San Antonio. The police notified Beverly Dollarhide, Beverly called her daughter Carrie, and together they called the youth shelter in Spain so that they could hear Nicholas's voice for themselves. Maybe it was the poor quality of the international call. Maybe it was the old phone that they were using at the youth shelter. But Nicholas sounded muffled and far away when he spoke to his mother and sister. But they heard him say that he wanted to come home. And Carrie immediately volunteered to fly to Spain, get her brother, and bring him back where he belonged so that their family could be whole again. So uh, Leonaris is located in Andalusia, Spain. It's got a pretty large population, about 60,000 people. But how in the world did Nicholas Barclay get from San Antonio, Texas to the south of Spain? Well, here's what he said happened. A now 16-year-old Nicholas said that he was at the basketball courts that day in 1994. And as he was leaving to walk home, two young boys about his age walked over to him and they began talking to him. As they chatted, someone came up behind him and put something over his mouth. And the next thing he knew, he was being flown overseas, where he was kept hostage in a room with other young kids. Apparently, he had been abducted by some international human trafficking operation. They'd smuggled him into Europe, where he and other kids were sexually abused day after day, night after night, by high-ranking military officials from America, Mexico, and Europe. But that wasn't all. Nicholas and the other kids had also been tortured. Nicholas himself had been forced to eat bugs. He'd been beaten. They'd broken both of his hands with a baseball bat, and his right hand had been broken more than once. They broke his fingers. They broke his left foot with a crowbar. They burned him with cigarettes. All of the kids were forced to stop speaking their native language and speak French. And they would also be forced to wear these headphones. And inside the headphones, they could hear the same message being played repeatedly. You are not you. And this was done for the purposes of stripping their identities and their memories of where they'd come from, who had loved them before they were forced into this nightmare who they were. For three years, Nicholas and the others were moved around from place to place, city to city, country to country, and he never knew where he was until one day a guard accidentally left the door of his room open. He was able to run out and escape. He found his way outside and he ran for help. A couple on the streets of Leonaris saw Nicholas wandering around, lost, crying, and confused, and they called the police who then brought Nicholas to the youth shelter. It was at that point that he found out he was in Spain, but he had no idea how he had gotten there, and he had no clue of how to get back to the place he had escaped from, because he wasn't familiar with the city, of course. It's a truly terrifying story, but we've heard of similar things happening. We know that they do happen, right? That human trafficking is a real thing. It's a thriving and profitable business for a lot of really bad individuals. Now, the real unbelievable part is that Nicholas was able to escape. That was the true miracle because most are not able to ever get free once they're taken. When Nicholas's sister Carrie arrived at the youth shelter in Leonaris, her brother was presented to her for the first time. He was all bundled up. He was wearing sunglasses and a hat. He had a large scarf wrapped around his neck in the lower portion of his face. But even so, she immediately knew that this was her long-lost brother, Nicholas. And she rushed to him. She took him in her arms. She hugged him tight, tight enough where she imagined he would never be able to get away again. Later, Carrie explained how she was feeling in that moment, saying, quote, 
It's just the sense of immense relief, just seeing, touching, kissing, holding him. He's here. We're here. I have him. I remember touching his nose and telling him, I remember that nose. You kind of look like your Uncle Pat. End quote. Carrie remembered that Nicholas told her he loved her, but he was very quiet other than that, and he didn't say much until they were shown into a visitor's room, where Carrie proceeded to pull out dozens of family pictures to show Nicholas how everyone had changed and grown in the past few years. She showed him pictures of his mother, Beverly, and his grandparents, and his brother, Jason. She showed him pictures of her own family, her husband, Brian, and their two children, 14-year-old Cody and 10-year-old Chantel, who would be Nicholas's nephew and niece. And Nicholas smiled, and he said things like, Mom put on some weight. Jason pretty much looks the same. Oh, look at Cody. He's gotten so big. Is grandpa still an asshole? Later, Carrie would call her mother Beverly and let her know that she had gotten to Spain and she was with Nicholas. Carrie said that Nicholas had grown up a lot. He looked very different and he was quieter than she remembered him being. Carrie said, quote, he talked in a funny accent, but it was always in a whisper, very quiet, like he was hiding from something. But I mean, God, look what he'd been through. He wasn't the same person. He wasn't the same Nicholas that had disappeared four years before. He'd been held and tortured, and God knows what else. He wasn't that same person, end quote. So Nicholas obviously spoke English, right? But remember that guy who ran the shelter, Jonathan Durian? He had claimed that the kid he was with spoke English with an American accent. Carrie noticed that Nicholas did not have an American accent at all. It was an accent that she didn't really recognize. She wasn't like a world traveler. But she knew it wasn't an American accent, and Nicholas had an explanation for that. He said that from the moment he had been abducted, he'd been forbidden to speak English. And this is part of, like, stripping him of his identity. So in order to communicate with the guards or the other kids that he was being held with, he had to learn to speak French, as this was the only language all of the kids were allowed to speak. And apparently they gave them, like, audio tapes so that they could listen to people speaking French and learn French. And like I said, this was, according to Nicholas, to help in the process of stripping his former identity because language is a big part of identity and culture and it connects a person to their past and their family. But a new accent wasn't the only thing about Nicholas that had changed. When he was 13, Nicholas had bright blue eyes and that floppy blonde hair. Post-kidnapping, 16-year-old Nicholas had this darker, coarser, almost yellow colored hair, and his eyes were brown. Now, Nicholas sadly explained that this was because all of the kids had been forced to change their appearances as they went from place to place. Their hair would be bleached, dyed all different colors, and his had been apparently stripped with bleach and changed colors so many times that it had permanently changed the color and texture of his hair. As for his eyes, that was a darker story. His captors had not only tortured him, they had performed bizarre medical experiments on him, including using needles to inject chemicals into his eyes. And as a result of all of these unknown chemicals, his eyes had been permanently darkened. The Nicholas that Carrie had known three years before had been wild and crazy with this huge, loud, sometimes obnoxious personality. But now he was quiet, withdrawn, and just different. But once again, he'd been through hell. And he still had those three tattoos. He still had that little gap between his two front teeth and the family nose. And his favorite singer was still Michael Jackson. Carrie spoke to an FBI agent named Nancy Fisher. And she said, you know, to Nancy, without a doubt, this is my brother Nicholas, and I'm ready to bring him home. Now, Nancy said, okay, she would make the arrangements, but as soon as Carrie and Nicholas arrived back in the States, she wanted to see Nicholas in person. She wanted to interview him, mainly to see like what had happened to him so that the FBI could hopefully track down the people who had done this to him and stop them from doing it to anyone else. Because at, at this point, Nicholas is saying there's this huge, like terrible trafficking syndicate out there who's snatching kids from all over the not only the country but the world, right, and doing these terrible things to them, obviously the authorities in the United States are going to want to get involved, find out who these people are, find out where they are, and, and try to stop them. 
Now, even with Carrie swearing that this was her brother, the authorities in Leonaris and the State Department in the United States, they obviously needed to be sure. So they had the judges in Leonaris interview Nicholas. They showed him five pictures from a family photo album that Carrie had brought with her to Spain. And they asked Nicholas to tell them who was in the pictures. Now, Nicholas was able to get everything right except for some details on the fifth picture. But apparently... That was good enough for everyone, and he was issued a United States passport under the name Nicholas Barclay, and he boarded a plane to Texas with Carrie the next day. So once again, quick recap. The kid goes missing in San Antonio, Texas, shows up three years later in Leonora, Spain, 5,000 miles away, different country. Nicholas Barclay has changed. His appearance has changed a lot. His eyes aren't even the same color anymore, but... You know, he has explanations for that, and apparently nobody questioned those explanations or even, you know, consulted with somebody to make sure that something like that was possible. They were like, hey, who's in these pictures? After Nicholas's sister Carrie had already showed him a bunch of pictures, he was like, oh, that's mom, and that's Jason, and that's, you know, Uncle Ed or whatever. And they were like, okay, here's your passport. (laughs) You're a citizen of the United States now. I just wanted to repeat it in that way so you would realize how absolutely ridiculous that is, that there was no DNA testing done, no fingerprinting done, no (laughs) real investigation done before they handed this guy a passport and said, go home with your sister and have a good life. Now, as they were flying on the plane, Carrie said her brother was very quiet, and he became incredibly nervous at some point during the flight. He started to tremble. He was sweating. And when she attempted to comfort him, he told her he was afraid the plane was going to crash. Carrie said that at first she didn't understand why her little brother seemed so nervous and on edge. But once again, she attributed this to Nicholas being scared and out of sorts. She had been told what he had lived through, but she didn't truly understand it. How could she? She hadn't experienced it. And maybe Nicholas was really worried that he'd been so damaged and that he had changed so much his family wouldn't love or accept him anymore. Carrie and Nicholas landed in San Antonio, Texas on October 18, 1997, and a crowd of family members were waiting at the airport to greet them including Nicholas's mother, Beverly, uh, Carrie's husband, Brian, and their kids, Cody and Chantel. But someone was not present at this happy reunion, and that person was Nicholas's older half-brother, Jason. Now, there is a video of Nicholas getting off the plane at the airport and everyone rushing to hug him. And he's again wearing sunglasses, a hat pulled low over his face. He's got gloves on his hands. Um, You can see this. I believe it's in that documentary that I was telling you about. I'll see if I can find a clip of it to put in here. But you can see that almost everyone immediately rushes to greet him, except for his mother, Beverly. She hung back a little bit. Carrie's son, Cody, said that everyone was so emotionally crazy, just so happy. But Carrie's daughter, Chantel, said that Beverly, quote, didn't seem excited the way you'd expect from someone seeing her son, end quote. When Beverly was interviewed for this documentary, she explained this, saying, quote, I wanted to run and grab him, but he held back. So I walked down and grabbed his hand and hugged him and told him I missed him. He had changed so much. It was like mind boggling. But then I realized, you know, you tell yourself he's been through all this horrendous stuff. So he's absolutely going to be different. He was totally covered up. So then I got scared. This kid's really messed up just by his appearance. End quote. Another strange thing is that Beverly, who had since moved out of the house she'd been living in when Nicholas went missing and she'd moved into an apartment in San Antonio, she decided that it would be best if Nicholas did not come to live with her. Instead, it was decided that he would live with his sister Carrie and her family in their small trailer in the Spring Branch area, which is about 35 miles outside of San Antonio. Now, there's some reasons given for why Beverly felt Nicholas would be better off with Carrie than with her. It's been reported that since she worked nights, Beverly felt Nicholas would be alone a lot, and she didn't think he was ready to be left alone right away, even though, I mean, he's going to be alone at night when he should be sleeping, so he he wouldn't technically be alone. But I guess if she's sleeping during the day, he'd still be alone, so that makes sense. It's also been said that Beverly felt having Nicholas there would be too upsetting for her. And that's kind of like the opposite reaction you'd expect from a mother who believed her son had been abducted for three years and then finally he comes home and he's there now and you can make up for all this lost time, but you don't want him to live with you. 
So on the way home in Carrie's car, they all stopped at McDonald's for cheeseburgers. And as they drove, Nicholas was very quiet, but he did say some things. He told his nephew Cody that he missed school. And he also asked when he was going to see his brother, Jason. And I'm not sure that Nicholas Barclay would really miss school, considering, as we talked about, he rarely ever went. And when he was there, he wasn't doing very well because of his ADD, and he was threatening his teachers. So I, I think that that would have been a red flag for me. If, if I was his family member, I would have been like, Nicholas, since when do you like school? But maybe, you know, he's been in captivity for three years. Maybe in those three years, he realized how important the simple things were. You know, the, the childhood things like going to school and having a safe place to lay your head at night and having a family around. Maybe those three years put into perspective for Nicholas what was truly important to him. OK, so let's let's pause for a minute. I know I'm sort of burying the lead here. But I cannot go on without showing you this picture and wondering out loud how in the world anyone thought that this person was the same person who had three years prior looked like this. Not only that, but how did anyone think that this guy was 16 years old? He has like an obvious perpetual five o'clock shadow. The skin tone isn't even the same. This guy has darker, more olive colored skin than Nicholas. And this wasn't like 10 or 15 years had passed. Only three years had passed. You wouldn't look that different in three years, no matter what happened to you. And Nicholas's sister, Carrie, his own mother, Beverly, everyone at that airport was like, okay, this checks out. This makes complete sense. He looks nothing like Nicholas, but he is Nicholas, and let's bring him home. But Nicholas did settle into life with Carrie and her family very well, pretty much seamlessly. He shared a room with Carrie's son, Cody. They would play video games together and watch movies together because, I mean, they're about the same age, right? Nicholas was enrolled in high school where he made friends. He even developed a little crush on a girl named Amy, and they would talk to each other on the phone and Carrie in the documentary says like, oh, you know, he'd hang out with her and they'd be talking on the phone all night. And if you asked Nicholas about Amy, he would like blush and get bashful and kind of not know what to say, which is so weird knowing the end like I do. Every night, Nicholas would come home from school and he would dutifully complete his homework and he would like sort of scold Cody if Cody didn't do his schoolwork fast enough or spend enough time on it. This Nicholas, he went to church with the family every Sunday. He took the bus to visit his mother every week. He went out for drives with uh, Carrie's husband, Brian. He hung out at the park with Cody and their classmates. And one day, when Cody saw Nicholas in a moment of quiet contemplation, he asked him, you know, what are you thinking? And Nicholas responded, quote, it's really good to have my family and be home again, end quote. Now, there were some moments of confusion for Nicholas. Sometimes his sister would be driving through their old neighborhoods and she'd be like, hey, remember this building? Remember this landmark? Like, this is where we always used to like to go get ice cream. Uh, this is where you went to school. This is where you used to hang out with your friends, things like that. But Nicholas didn't remember any of those buildings or landmarks. Other times he'd be approached by old neighbors or old family friends. But Nicholas didn't remember their names or who they were. Now, this was explained as simply being gaps in his memory, memory loss, because of all he had been through, because of the brainwashing. He was able to remember, like, his close family members because, you know, they were a constant in his life. But anything that kind of came in and out of his life, he would have a hard time remembering those things. And it was understandable that he was going to have some blank spots. You know, he was tortured, brainwashed. He was tortured and brainwashed by people who wanted him to forget who he had been. And it looked like that process had started to really work. Now, everyone seemed to welcome and accept Nicholas with open arms, except for his half-brother, Jason. Now, when Nicholas had gotten back to Texas, Jason didn't go to the airport to greet him. Uh, Jason had still actually been at that rehab facility that he checked into at the end of 1996. Apparently, he had gotten clean, but then he remained at this facility working as a counselor and also working for a landscape business that the facility owned and operated. So for a year after getting clean, Jason stayed at this facility and, you know, tried to help other people. And he was like making a living and doing work, working with his hands, working outside. It did seem like he was sort of on the right track, like he was getting his life back together. But the weird thing is, 
if you were the older brother of a boy who went missing and you had this weight on you, this guilt on you from, you know, thinking that maybe your brother got abducted because you refused to give him a ride on that day. You'd think as soon as he got back, you'd be rushing. You'd be the first in line to see him, you know, to not only make yourself feel better, to take your guilt away, but to apologize to him for not picking him up that day. You want to make amends. You want to make things better. It's a new start now. You can put all this behind you. He's home. But Jason didn't go to the airport. And it was a month and a half before Jason paid his little brother a visit. That's a long time, right? Apparently, Nicholas's disappearance had caused Jason to feel so much guilt, he had lost himself in drugs and alcohol and grief, and now he's clean, he's clear-headed, Nicholas is back. You'd think this would be great all around. Jason wasn't locked in that facility. You know, he wasn't technically a patient there. He could have gone to the airport and picked Nicholas up with everyone else, or he could have gone to Carrie's trailer that same night or the next day or at any time, but he had chosen to wait a month and a half. And when Jason first saw Nicholas, he acted very standoffish, and he was kind of looking at him suspiciously. In fact, I believe it was Cody, Carrie's son, who was like, you know, Jason wouldn't stop looking at Nicholas the whole time, kind of like out of the corner of his eye. And something that everyone noticed was that Jason would not call his brother Nicholas. Like, he wouldn't call Nicholas by his name. And he just really didn't seem too happy to see him. So he was there for a very short time. He really didn't talk much, but before leaving, Jason told Nicholas, good luck, and then he walked out of the door of Carrie's trailer, and he never came back. Now, remember, there was an FBI agent, Nancy Fisher, and Nancy Fisher had instructed Carrie to bring Nicholas in for an interview as soon as they got back to the States. But as the weeks passed, Nicholas did not show up for this interview, and Nancy, she sort of had to track him down and insist that he be brought in, and rightly so, because there's some terrible trafficking ring out there. Nicholas is apparently the only one who's ever escaped from it. He's the only one who knows anything about them. And even though he's claiming he doesn't remember anything about, like, where he was or their travels, he might still be able to provide some helpful details about what the people who were holding him looked like, what he heard, what languages they spoke, what they said to him. He might even remember something he'd seen as he was running away from that place that could lead authorities to where he'd been being held in Spain. And at least they could look at that place and check to see if there was any sign of what he was claiming. So finally, Nicholas did go in and he sat down with Nancy Fisher and he told her the entire terrible story all over again. And she's obviously shocked and disgusted by what had happened to him. Like, it's horrendous to hear. I can't even imagine being um, an FBI agent who has to, like, look into and investigate these instances of child abuse and sex trafficking. And I feel like I would just never be happy again. You know what I mean? I would never be happy again. And Nancy said, you know, like, yeah, we, the FBI, we already knew about this type of activity. We knew that there was things like this going on around the world. And Nicholas provided very specific details about what he had been through that were shocking and that turned her stomach. And she felt so bad for him. She never considered that he might have made anything up. She was like, who would make up something like this? Like, what kind of mind would it take to make something up like this and to say it out loud? And Nicholas seemed to be really and truly traumatized by what he had been through. Carrie's husband, Brian, said that it had looked as if Nicholas had been terribly abused and tortured. He had cigarette burns down the back of his neck and on his legs. He walked with a limp, and his right hand looked as if it had been broken and never properly medically attended to. So why wouldn't anybody believe him? Why wouldn't they think that he was being completely honest? And for a while, Nicholas seemed to be really happy to be back with his family and out of danger. He was really enjoying his renewed opportunity to have a normal life after the nightmare he had lived through. But after about two months, Nicholas began to act strangely. He became suddenly withdrawn, quiet, moody. He seemed depressed, distracted. He not only stopped doing his homework, but he stopped going to school, and eventually he was suspended. In December, Nicholas stole Carrie's car, and he drove all the way to Oklahoma, blasting Michael Jackson with the windows down. He was pulled over for speeding, and his family had to go and pick him up and bring him home. Right before Christmas, 
Nicholas locked himself in the bathroom, and he mutilated his face with a razor. He was then admitted to a psychiatric hospital for observation, but after a couple of days, it was determined that he was okay, and he was released back to Cary. Now, the FBI had instructed Nicholas and his family to keep quiet, stay out of the spotlight. He was told not to talk to the media or anyone else about what had happened to him because the authorities were investigating this trafficking ring. And if the ring found out that Nicholas was home and talking about them, they might run and hide somewhere. They might change their methods, and then they would never be found. He's putting all of these people's lives in danger, all of these kids' lives in danger, if he publicly talks about what he went through. But the story of this miracle, this little boy going missing, being abducted by this international criminal syndicate who were connected to the military and the government, and then he makes this amazing escape and he's finally reunited with his family, of course, that caught the attention of many, many people, including many television shows, including Hard Copy. So Hard Copy wanted to locate Nicholas. And they couldn't really find him, so they hired a private investigator named Charlie Parker to track Nicholas down and convince him to do an interview with their program. Nicholas Barclay is now 16 years old. He vanished when he was 13. Nicholas says he was kidnapped and taken to Spain. He says for three years he was repeatedly drugged, beaten, and raped, all part of a sex slave operation involving dozens of missing children. He claims his captors changed his appearance to make him unrecognizable. He was no longer allowed to speak English. Did they rape you all every night? Me? No. <laughs> because they, they didn't trap me every night. Some of them, they like more. <laughs> Some of the kids, they like more. They rap them usually um, two or three times a week. Now that you've seen that clip, that video, does he look 16 to you? Looks like a grown-ass man to me, okay? A grown-ass man. But anyways, I digress. Charlie Parker, the P.I., that had tracked Nicholas down, he was actually present in Carrie's living room while this interview was happening. And he was kind of standing there watching. And I remember in an interview that I read with um, Charlie Parker, he said something like, this kid was as cool as a cucumber. He wasn't giving away anything in his body language. He wasn't looking down. He wasn't nervous. He wasn't fidgeting. Cool as a cucumber. But As Charlie Parker was standing there and watching, he noticed a picture, a picture of Nicholas when he was 13, and it was like on a shelf in Carrie's living room. So Charlie Parker grabbed that picture. He looked at it, and he looked at the man who was talking to the cameras in front of him, and something just seemed off. I noticed that the the real Nicholas Barclay had blue-gray eyes. The imposter's eyes were brown. And I asked the cameraman to zoom in on his ears. His ears? It's a technique Scotland Yard uses uh, to identify people. Uh, The ear is the only part of the human body that doesn't age. Hmm. And I knew if I could compare the ears, I could could know what I had here. So I got to uh, my office, compared the ears, and I knew instantly I had an imposter. So Charlie actually, like, snatched this picture, the the picture of young Nicholas. He, like, took it and folded it up and put it in his pocket. He stole the picture, and he went to his office, and he put that picture as well as a screenshot from the hard copy interview into Photoshop. So he could basically overlay the pictures of Nicholas's ears and compare them, and he saw that the ears were different. At this point, Charlie Parker doesn't know what the hell's going on, but he knows that the person who's saying he's Nicholas Barclay is not Nicholas Barclay. And Charlie said he didn't know why someone would pretend to be a missing kid, but he figured, like, there's no good reason for it, no innocent reason for it. Maybe this person pretending to be Nicholas might be a spy who was in the United States for nefarious reasons. Like, did we, the United States, the State Department, just hand like a terrorist, a U.S. passport, and fly him into Texas. What's going on here? So Charlie kind of started following Nicholas around at this point just to make sure that he wasn't, like, planting anything or stealing anything or spying on anybody. So he just, like, followed him around constantly. And Charlie also did some digging and investigating. He called an ophthalmologist school, and he asked, listen, is it possible for someone's eye color to be changed if their eyes are like injected with chemicals or something like that. Now, in fact, um, we actually talked about this in one of my dark history series on um, the angel of death, Joseph Mengele. I will link it in the description box if you haven't seen it. It's 
very, very interesting and sad, but we talk about a lot of things, a lot of uh, implications and kind of go over, we go over a lot in that series. But the Nazis tried to do this too. They tried to change people's eye colors by injecting chemicals into their eyes. And it was never successful. It always failed because you can't do it. Um, in fact, what ended up happening was they would get sick. They would sometimes die. They would become blind. But you wouldn't see chemicals being injected into somebody's eyes and their eye color changing permanently, which once again is something I feel like the State Department and the FBI should have known, okay? But no, they didn't. Charlie Parker also called a dialect expert at Trinity University in San Antonio, and this expert told him that even if someone had been held in captivity for years, not allowed to speak their native language, they would quickly regain their original accent after returning to their normal life and their country of birth. Now, according to the Linguistic Society of America, most people have a defined set of sounds by the time they reach puberty, usually around 11 or 12 years of age. This was also the opinion of forensic psychiatrist Bruce D. Perry, who met with Nicholas at the Texas Children's Hospital to help him deal with his trauma and to see if he could recover buried memories of what had happened to him once again in an attempt to identify the people who had taken him. Now, Nicholas had been sent to Houston to talk to Dr. Perry by FBI agent Nancy Fisher, who had already spoken to private investigator Charlie Parker. And Charlie Parker had told Nancy his suspicions that Nicholas was not Nicholas. And when Nancy first heard that Charlie suspected Nicholas was an imposter, she basically told him, like, be careful, don't interfere in a federal investigation. Later, Nancy would explain this by saying, quote, I thought I didn't have the right to question the family statement that this is their family member, because how could they be wrong? I mean, no one would be wrong about something like that. Why would you ever take in a stranger? This must be Nicholas Barclay, end quote. Listen, once again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but Nancy. Come on, Nancy. Come on, Nancy Pants. What are you talking about here? It is actually your job to ask questions. You absolutely have the right to ask questions and question things that don't make sense to you. You're an FBI agent. I think that's like what your one job is. It's what you're supposed to do. Ask questions. Get to the truth. Right? But no, she doesn't want to ruffle any feathers. She doesn't want to insult anybody. Charlie Parker had also contacted Nicholas's mother, Beverly Dollarhide, and he told her the same thing. He was like, listen, I talked to these people. They say it's impossible to change eye color. They say this kid still shouldn't have an accent this long after being with you. I believe the person claiming to be your son, Nicholas, is not your son at all. But Beverly told Charlie Parker that he was wrong and that she had no doubt that this person was Nicholas. And she was very agitated that he would even suggest otherwise. So Nicholas goes with Nancy Fisher to Houston to talk to Bruce Perry, the forensic psychiatrist. And Bruce Perry said that as soon as Nicholas spoke, his instincts told him something was not right. Perry said, quote, I didn't see the same physiological change in his body posture, in his pupil size, or in his heart rate that I would normally see in someone who is talking about a traumatic experience. He couldn't speak English without an accent. That told me about the development of his brain and the development of language. You just cannot be raised for the first six to seven years in an English-speaking home and later on not be able to speak English without an accent. I guarantee you that this kid was not raised in an English-speaking family, end quote. And I looked into this some more. Research has shown that for kids under the age of 11 or 12, learning a new language and speaking it with a foreign accent, it's very easy. And it often happens naturally. And that's why if you have very young children, you should be you know, exposing them to different languages because that's when they're going to like absorb it like a sponge. And that is because children easily pick up on the sounds and stress patterns of a new language, which really form like the accent, the way you speak. It's easier for children to move their muscles in new ways in order to make speech sounds because their brain and their muscles are not as rigid as older people. And that's why music is also connected with language and why musicians often have an easier time of picking up new languages because they're using that part of their brain and they're also moving their mouth, their muscles in their mouth and their tongue in different ways than they would normally if they were just speaking English. But for someone over the age of 12 
and remember Nicholas was 13 when he went missing, it would become more difficult. You would need to teach your ears to hear different speech patterns. Not only that, you would have to train your mouth to make new sounds you had never done before. It's, of course, very possible to learn a new language, but as an older person, we'll never be able to speak that language like a native speaker because we have to like change all of the habits we've learned for years, like the way you move your mouth when making certain speech sounds and rhythms. And that's why you guys shouldn't give me a hard time when I don't pronounce things like foreign states or cities completely correctly because I try, but I didn't grow up learning that language, and so it's impossible for me to pronounce it exactly the way that somebody who lives there or speaks that language forever pronounces it, right? So be, be easier on me, guys. There's a reason for this. So at this point, Nancy Fisher, the FBI agent, she's thinking, okay, I guess Charlie Parker was on to something. You know, when she heard what Bruce Perry's conclusion was, she kind of felt like, well, Charlie Parker's a PI. Maybe he doesn't know what he's talking about, which is rude, but okay. But she hears from the expert, Bruce Perry, and she's like, I believe this now. So she called Nicholas's sister, Carrie. Remember, Nancy and Nicholas are still in Houston. Nancy calls Carrie in San Antonio, and she's like, listen, this is not your brother. It's not possible that the guy who's been sleeping in your home in the same room as your teenage son for months is your brother. And she claims that Carrie was shocked. And Carrie was like, oh, no, how could this happen? What do I do? Nancy Fisher told Carrie, do nothing. Stay home. Don't come to the airport to pick Nicholas up when we get back from Houston. Nancy told Carrie, listen, don't worry. This is terrible. What a terrible situation this is. But you do not have to take this guy back in. I've already called the State Department. We are on it. We're going to take care of it. Don't worry. Now, later, Carrie would claim that she didn't remember Nancy expressing it in this exact way. She didn't remember Nancy coming right out and saying, like, there's no possible way this guy could be Nicholas. Um, I don't know who to believe, but I kind of believe Nancy. And that's just my opinion. Allegedly, don't come for me. I believe Nancy Fisher on this matter. And when Nancy Fisher and Nicholas got off the plane in San Antonio... Nancy was stunned to see Carrie there, waiting for them. She said Carrie rushed right over to Nicholas. She hugged him. She asked him how his trip was. And then she said, get your bag. Let's go home. Later, Nancy Fisher would say, quote, she welcomed this person home as if he was her brother. I didn't have any clue why she would behave in this manner. Because in my conversation with her, I had said, this person is not your brother. End quote. So while still at the airport, Nancy Fisher called the U.S. Attorney's Office and she's like, what the heck do I do? This is so unexpected. She wants to bring him home. I don't know what's going on. I told her that we don't believe this guy is Nicholas Barclay, but she still is here to pick him up and calling him Nicholas and acting like nothing happened. And she claims that the assistant U.S. attorney told her, listen, OK, don't worry about it. Let Carrie take Nicholas home temporarily and we're going to figure out what to do next. So Nancy Fisher and private investigator Charlie Parker, they were sort of like conducting their own investigations separately. But when Nancy got confirmation from Bruce Perry, she kind of reconnected with Charlie Parker. And she was like, OK, you might be right. And they would sort of check in with each other and share any information that they had learned. Charlie, like I said, he's following Nicholas around because he claimed he didn't know why this guy was in Texas and what his motives were. And it's funny because in an interview, Charlie Parker says he would like follow him to um, Beverly Dollar Hyde's house. He'd follow him to the bus stop. And he said that th this kid who was claiming to be Nicholas or this person claiming to be Nicholas would do like Michael Jackson moves while he was wearing his Walkman on the way to the bus. So whoever it was definitely loved Michael Jackson, regardless of his true identity. Nancy Fisher, the FBI agent, she called the CIA and she asked for their help. But they told her, you know, unless you can prove that Nicholas isn't Nicholas, we can't do anything. Now, Nancy knew that the only way to actually prove it was to get DNA samples from Nicholas's family and from the person claiming to be Nicholas, as well as to get his fingerprints to see if they were in the system. Nancy tried to get Beverly to give a DNA sample several times. But Beverly, as well as Carrie and the rest of the family, whoever was blood related, they outright refused. They said they didn't need to prove that he was Nicholas because they knew he was Nicholas. At this point, Nancy Fisher felt there was something deeper going on, something deeper than a guy pretending to be a missing teenage boy. And she said, quote, I no longer saw them as a grieving, victimized family. 
I saw them as a very questionable family. There would be no reason for them to accept a stranger into their lives unless there was something to hide, end quote. By the middle of February, four months after Nicholas had returned from Spain, Nancy Fisher was able to get a warrant for the blood samples as well as for the fingerprints. And she claims when she went to execute this warrant, Beverly Dollarhide was still refusing. And she said, I know this is my son. I don't have to give you anything. And then Beverly laid down on the floor and she was like, you can't pick me up. You can't make me. And Nancy Fisher said that Beverly was not just apathetic. She was outright hostile. Beverly claims she does remember initially not wanting to give the samples, but she doesn't remember outright refusing to do so. Once again, I sort of have to believe Nancy Fisher on this point. If I'm looking at do I believe Beverly Dollarhide or Nancy Fisher, I believe that it went down exactly as Nancy Fisher said. And I mean, she's an FBI agent. She may have uh, missed a lot of obvious things early on, but I think that's because she felt bad because she thought that this was truly a kid who had been through like the most traumatic experience you could ever consider a kid going through. And and she probably felt bad and didn't want to push, didn't want to be disrespectful. Um, But at this point, you know, she's writing reports. She's reporting back to superiors. She's not going to make up something and then be caught in a lie because she could lose her job. But even though Beverly was, you know, throwing a fit, throwing a temper tantrum, lying on the floor, Nancy Fisher had a warrant. So it didn't matter how hostile that Beverly Dollarhide was. Even before the DNA results returned, there was a hit in Interpol for the fingerprints that Nicholas had provided. And as Charlie Parker and Nancy Fisher had suspected, this person was not Nicholas Barclay. The man was quickly arrested outside of Beverly's apartment because apparently he'd been staying there after his stint in the psychiatric hospital because Carrie had felt unsafe with him in the house. So he went and stayed with Beverly in an apartment. And Nancy Fisher claims that when they arrived to put the cuffs on this guy pretending to be Nicholas, Beverly Dollarhide yelled out, what took you so long? But who this person really was and why he had pretended to be Nicholas, why his mother and sister had believed he was Nicholas, and what it all meant in regards to what had actually happened to the real Nicholas, that is a whole different story. And that is what we will pick up with in part two of this series. It's not going to be long. I already have it written and researched and noted. So I'm going to record it um, shortly after this, and it'll go up probably just within a couple of days after this post. So keep a lookout for that. If it's already up, I will post it in the description box of this video so you can just navigate from here to there. Thank you so much for being here with me, guys. I know that for me personally, the past three weeks or so have been kind of rough mentally and emotionally. I haven't been feeling my best. I do go through these sorts of phases. Um, I'm down and out. I don't know why. And I just don't feel great. I don't feel very um, energetic. I don't feel very inspired. I don't feel good at all. And then one day I just wake up and it turns around and I feel better. And I kind of really relish that feeling better part because I know that there's going to come a time that I'm going to feel down again. And I just never know when that's going to happen. So I really like try to make the best out of the times when I'm feeling great. Right now, I'm feeling very good, motivated, excited. I have lots of plans, lots of things going on in my head, lots of great things coming. I want to start going live. Um, I used to go live all the time, but I haven't been going live and I can't even make any promises because like I said, there's periods of my month where I just don't feel like doing anything and I'm mentally and emotionally exhausted and drained and I have nothing to offer. But there's times when I'm feeling good. And when I post certain videos, for instance, the uh, Dylan Rounds case, a lot of people had questions. There was like conversations in the comment section that I wanted to address. I wanted to answer some of the questions with details that I found out since. So I would I would like to you know start going live maybe a, a day or so after I post a video so we can have a discussion about that video in that case. That would be fun. I think that I would enjoy that. I would enjoy going live again. It's just like I never know I'm going to feel and I never know what my my brain and my body is going to let me do. And, you know, I do like to spend time. I work a lot. So I like work from very early in the morning until like five, six at night. And then I like to spend time with my kids, give them baths, put them to bed, read to them, hang out. So, you know, I I don't know. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to find a time and a place where it makes sense for my schedule and where I'll be like ready to interact with you guys. But there's a lot of stuff that I want to do. There's a lot of stuff coming down the pipe. Uh, On Crime Weekly, we are covering the Springfield 3 case, a very mysterious disappearance of three women 
women. If you want to check that out, because a lot of people have requested that I cover it here. So I'm doing it on Crime Weekly. If you want to check it out, I've linked everything in the description box for you to go check out Crime Weekly for yourself. Also, don't forget to check out my coffee company, Criminal Coffee Company. It is the best coffee you will ever drink. I promise I'm not even being like dramatic i'm serious it's the best coffee we made sure that it was good before we put it out for you guys because i don't want to put out a garbage product for you ever it's really really good coffee so go check that out follow me on instagram and twitter links are in the description box check out native links are in the description box thank you so much to my patreons who are so awesome who are so patient with me who i think by now understand that i'm a scattered brained random sort of person. I think they've figured out my patterns by now, my behavior patterns, my mood patterns. And it's kind of like having like a bunch of friends that that get you. And I love that. So thank you so much to them for everything. Uh, Stay tuned for the next episode. You are not going to want to miss it. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I will see you very, very soon. Straight down And that river runs deep The mouths get steep And the voice is getting too loud Oh, these feelings are very It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say your hell Mary Well, you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly And so you got To let it go I got blood